Hello, Living Word family. We are glad that you've joined us on YouTube. We want you to be a part of this message that touches your life every day. So on behalf of Pastor Pierre, my wife and I, we are glad that you engage. We want you to subscribe because there's so many messages on here that you could listen to on your leisure. We are glad that we're able to serve you. But we also want you to go to our website. When you go to our website, you will find a lot more information, even the sermon outlines. And also, you can provide an opportunity for you to see a list of our materials, books that you could look at that meets your need, and you could share with other family members or friends. We could also give. As you give to Living Word, you know us. When you go to our website and you do that, we use those funds to serve the agenda of God for the glory of God, and that allows us to serve you effectively. So we're glad you're here with us. Subscribe, be a part of this, and I pray you join us again and keep involved as God so leads you so that we grow through these times and are coming out of it better than we went in. Thanks for allowing us to serve you. are dismissed the youth are dismissed go with Jordan Washington our faithful youth pastor well before we even dive into the word of God this text is going to be somewhat teachy just bear with me but at the same time it's going to be historical and progressively and it's going to sound like it's on the negative side of things and I want to be careful not to highlight and make it seem like everything in government or everything in our systems are all bad. Right? We know we have good people who are trying to serve faithfully, but sadly, the negative gets highlighted. So I want to make sure that in the midst of me highlighting the truth biblically about justice and justice system, that we don't lose sight of the fact that God is still working within the church and God is still working, hopefully, within individuals within the government, maybe not always set up for the benefit of those. But as we take a break from our series from uh, as we were highlighting last week in Valentine's, which we know we had a great time, and I'm hoping y'all had a good time on Valentine's, a, a biblical time, a, a holy time. Um, today we're going to highlight a biblical perspective of what God is doing in justice. So I hope you will stick with me, but I won't belabor it, but let's get started. Let's pray. Um, dearly Father, I want to say thank you so much for the opportunity for us to talk about your justice, but also talk about the system in which you intended. Um, although it was intended well, because everything you do is right, um, sadly we have been able to have evidence in support of the justice system itself, not necessarily maintaining your standards. So God, what I would love to do is highlight A, who you are, B, your intent, C, that there's still hope in you. And I pray that everyone here, although we may have lost hope in certain systems or people, we have maintained our hope within you. God, you are a good and amazing God, and I pray that your word already is powerful, but I pray that our people receive it as such, that everything that they see and hear, they will walk away different than when they came, even if they are the slight change in an overarching system. God, we want to say we love you today. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I don't know how many of y'all have experienced this, and I haven't because I don't know exactly what I'm looking at. And this, this illustration spurned from the fact that my air conditioner started making noise in my car. Now, if you know anything about air conditions in cars, they're expensive. So I started, you know, because of money, I said, you know, let me see. Because somebody was like, man, it's maybe something stuck in your fan. And I was like, well, I can pull something out of a fan. So I popped my hood, and I looked at it. I found out where the noise is coming from. But there's nothing stuck in there, so after that, I closed the hood. I had nothing else I could do. I, I couldn't pull anything out. So therefore, all I know is there's a noise coming out of my heater, but that works, so I'm just going to keep driving it until there's no heat coming out. Now, I was starting to think about cars and how many of us have um, seen the outside of a car, and it looks good, right? We, we eat, some of us went to car lots, and we pray that we don't get a what? A lemon. And we know a lemon, don't get lemonade, a lemon gives you a whole bunch of heartache and pain. And what happens is that the car dealer, if not functioning ethically, what they'll do is they'll make the car look good on the outside. 
But what they'll do is they'll cover up everything. They even pray it starts when you started to test drive it because they know as soon as you get out a little bit further, something going out. They planned it. They knew it. They wanted to sell you on it. And then all of a sudden, you get in the car, and then you drive it a little ways, and then all of a sudden, it starts to break down on you and costing you a little bit of money. And that's exactly what happens sometimes in our government, is they're, they're painting it up on the inside, outside. They make it look good. They sell you on the fact that they care about you. But as soon as you start driving the system, something starts breaking on it. And as we celebrate Black History Month, we know that sometimes the system ain't necessarily been fair as we drove it off the lot. Now, I'm not here to highlight one person or color versus the other, but I am going to recognize historical facts. And historical facts would say that our justice system, better yet, our executive justice system has not necessarily been fair. Some of us has hopped in the car and had hope, went to the judge and realized that it wasn't no hope there, that people, that things, that there's lawyers and judges that have not necessarily functioned according to the ethical code that God has given. So we've all driven a lemon. So today I want to talk about a lemon that wasn't supposed to be, that the car was supposed to drive. However, we are in a system now where we have to at least highlight the fact that it's not there. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18, and while you're turning there, I want you to at least highlight some beautiful things that you'll see. While you're getting there, we want to at least go from Exodus here. So you'll read and hear some verses from Exodus. And you, if you have your notes, I would challenge you to look at your notes because there's a plenty of cross-references that will support the claims. Now, in all the way from Exodus, as they leave Egypt, they are going on, and then God starts to implement systems. As you notice, Moses was doing all of the judging. Then he realized through Jethro he wasn't supposed to do everybody, and then God starts to prepare them in Deuteronomy for having a local justice system. He says, hey, when you get to the promised land, uh, you're going to need a system in place to settle disputes. You're going to need a place where you can have a person in charge that will at least do the work of law and legalities, but also not just law and legalities, morality and ethics. Now, you know, it's one thing he didn't say you needed is you didn't need a king. And this is important because only humans think they needed a king. And because they saw other people with the king, they started saying, we need a king. Now, God uh, consented to their desire, but never wanted them to have a king. He only wanted them to have judges. So therefore, before we even highlight all the things at play, just know that some of us have made president kings. Some of us have put our hope into a system that God was never intending them to have hope in. There was never supposed to be a king in your life except the king of kings. And yet, yes, I want you to vote. I'm not telling you not to exercise the right that people die for you to have. However, sometimes when we vote, we also believe we're putting our, our vote into a king or a queen. But at the end of the day, that was never the intent. He just wanted to make sure that in the midst of your dispute, somebody sat in the middle and handled it correctly. Now, those people were supposed to have a, uh, watch these things. I'm going to break it into three codes. They were supposed to be, have a role. They were supposed to execute that role according to the standards of God. And then because of that, they will have a result of living prosperous in the land that God had given them. There was supposed to be a system at play. But we all know that sometimes we got a little bit of lemons. Watch what it says. You shall appoint. Now, this is what I love. It says you should do it. You're appointing. You're voting. You're the one making the call. And now let's just start here for a second when we talk about the roles of justice. It is your role if you are not the judge to appoint the right person. Now, if you go in and you don't do your research and we uneducatedly vote, don't get mad at your vote doing exactly what it's supposed to do. You put the number in. You said all Democrat, all Republican. That is exactly what you did. You did no checking on who it was. So, therefore, if you get an unethical person doing unethical things, you put the appoint on that person. So we all can talk about black history, but we all can talk about the right to vote. And if we have the right, you should appoint the right person. Now, the problem with many of us is we have lazy voters. Including me at times, because sometimes I ain't going to lie. I'm like, man, does it matter? (laughs) But one thing I know is that if the same way you do homework before you buy them J's is the same way you should do homework when you're fixing to have somebody ruling over your cases. We'll, We'll pick out what shoe came out in what year and what colorway has not come out yet. Some of us even know the release dates of Jordans that ain't come out yet. But some of us forget to vote. How do you forget to vote but know the J release date? 
Now, that might have been a little dating myself, but I do know that when I shop at Aldo, I know the release dates. <laughs> There's no release dates for those ugly shoes. It says, you shall appoint. So watch what it says next. For yourself. This is important. Because he's saying that person is going to be for you. Number one. Number two, I don't need it. Pay attention. There's a couple things I'm going to lay out to you that you're going to realize. God is saying, you need it, I don't. I don't need to be judged because I am the judge. I know I can rule well. Your job is to pick for somebody else you think can rule well. Not king. I'm good. Pick somebody who resembles me. It's really weird when we get to politics, though. Somehow we take away morality when we vote. I ain't going to say nothing. I'm not talking about a person because we ain't here to talk about that. But I am willing to say that evangelicals have tied themselves to individuals we know we wouldn't even live with. We wouldn't even claim that as our uncle. We'd be like, oh, no, we ain't blood. But somehow we'll do what? Oh, man, well, all I need him to do is what I want him to do. But can he do what you want him to do if he don't resemble who you are? And I'm not talking about skin. I'm talking about within. So I guess what I'm saying is you need it. So pick somebody you need that looks like you and believes what you believe. Not look on the outside. I'm talking about looks like you're supposed to resemble the character of God. If they don't, move around. But here's the thing. This is what I love about politics. As, remember, y'all remember this? This I am going to say. Y'all remember when they wore those dashikis and took a knee? <laughs> y'all, if you don't remember, just look it up. There's a whole bunch of people in the Senate. Y'all not going to say no names that wore a dashiki around their neck and took a knee. Because they already know. I don't really, it only takes me one day to pander the vote of a black man. I just got to dress the part. Now, my morality can be way off. But I just got to say what they want to hear. And as soon as I say what they want to hear, they're not going to check my morality or my ethics or even my past or my history. They just want to see if I'm going to wear this dashiki. Now, most of them call it out. Why? Because it looked awkward. And it looked weird, and they were also 89. <laughs> they couldn't get up. That was the problem. They were like, ah, ah. Watch what it says. Then he tells you the role. You notice he, he puts a name on it. He says, you shall appoint for yourself, watch these words, judges. No king, judges. Now, if you go all the way back to Exodus, you would find out that they were many of them were just elders that were ruling at the gates, meaning that the elders were selected based on their character. The character would go to the gate, the gates they would settle. So, therefore, you would walk to the gates. As you know with Ruth and Boaz, as last week, Boaz had to go to the gates in order to settle the claim. So, therefore, you had elders who would rule, but now God is saying, hey, no, no, no. They are a rolled position as a judge, and you shall pick those judges that will go to, watch these words, local towns. Now, this is important, not that you want it, but it's going to give you some historical facts. These local judges will go to local towns. That means you're not traveling far to get your justice. And it's funny how we'll pay attention to the national government, but many of us don't vote well for the local government. When the local government be the one that's affecting you because they're going to settle your claims. But let me tell you what the role of a judge was. Let me tell you at least what he was supposed to do. Not only was he supposed to have the morality and the character, which we'll get down to, he was supposed or she was supposed to be an agent of God's justice. They were supposed to resemble God. This is important. Because it's saying, hey, God's justice was supposed to come through the individual. So if you couldn't solve it, they could. That means they had to know what? They had to know not only the law, that's what many of us would like to say, but they had to know who God was. Because you can't be an agent of what you don't know. Now, I'm not talking about pandering Christianity. I'm not talking about pandering evangelicalism because I'm not going to sit here and talk about people that can't name books of the Bible. And then we vote. But I also am only going to say this is that you should want somebody who carries the agency of God. That means when I say the next definitions of what they should do, they have what? The ability to know who God is, so therefore they only function on his justice. Now, I might be asking for a lot, but let me lay this out for you for one second. 
You're, many of y'all are like, well, why do we even need this in the first place? The reason why you need judges because God's already telling you this, this life and this justice and this life won't be fair. This is the biggest thing I hope Christianity you would take away. One of the biggest things I hope you take away from this sermon. We got to ask for justice because this life ain't fair in the first place. We have too many mm, people who are unwilling to stand on what we need and what we want. And as long as our life good, we can care less about the justice of others. And God is like, this life won't be fair. You're going to need people that will stand on the ethics of God. You're going to need people who know the legalities of what God is saying is right and is wrong. And stop asking this life to be perfect. It will only happen when you see the judges of judges, the king of kings. That is the only time life will be fair and it will be just. Until then, Christians are supposed to fight on the behalf of justice because we're the only ones who know what justice is. So therefore, as African Americans who know our history and know what it feels like when we don't get justice, you would think that the church and African Americans would be the first to stand on justice. You would think that we would not be lazy when it comes to standing up for those who aren't getting it. You would think that there would be no bullies in our communities. You would think that we would make sure we clean up our streets because we know when our streets ain't clean, what happens to our streets? You would think that since you know that life won't be fair, that at least the people of God would know what God's justice looks like. So even if it's not coming from our system, it's coming from the church. Not only are its agents, but they had two jobs. One is was to release, watch these words, military presence in the case of emergency to protect peace and prosperity. That means they would say, hey, we have an emergency. They're, they're attacking our peace. They're attacking our lands. I need you to go. That was the one role of the judge. The second role of the judge was to make sure, watch these words, that everyone was protected under justice. That means that the poor, the wealthy, the disadvantaged, the orphans, the widows, everybody was protected under the law. We're going to talk about bias in a second. So that their role initially was to be unbiased in making sure that everybody had the rights to live well. Oh, we all know that rights are hard to come by. When I saw Mama on the screen, Ms. Dortha, I saw her talk about we had to go fight so that we could at least be seen in our equal rights. So we all know what it looks like when somebody is not created are equal, correct? So we all know what it feels like when somebody should be proceeding over. You know the crazy thing about what she had to do is that there were judges in place to make sure that they, she couldn't do it. So don't tell me we don't know what it looks like when people aren't in the right seats saying the right things and believing the right things. We had people who voted to make sure we couldn't sit at the counter. You know, sometimes I'll be hoping that the church produces not just more Christians, but Christians in the systems. Like, this, just hear me out. Like, I, 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 I'm cool. I, I want us all to have jobs that we feel like we love and enjoy. But I often wonder, is the church preparing the next generations of moral Christian politicians and judges and lawyers? But if you all we want is money just so we don't have to be what we were and we don't go and take what we've been given to go help somebody who doesn't have it, then what do we have? We have the most selfish system set up. Do you do what's best for you, and when you get out of the system, go make more money. And when you feel generous enough, hand somebody $10. And I'm like, no, no, no. If you're a lawyer, defend the person you knew you would need if you was in his situation. You wish the church would produce more people like that. But then it tells you not only towns but in your tribes. Make sure that you have people in their right spots in the right geographical locations. But on that, it says you also should have officers. Officers, I'm not going to be a dictionary today. It's basically saying it was the clerk. It was the one who wrote down what happened. That means after the court case was settled, somebody would make sure they enforced it. Some people believe they was policemen or police people. You can say that, but the bottom line is they were enforcers of the law. The officer would go out, he would record it, he would clerk it, and then he would make sure that it happened. But then it says what a judge should be. And this is where I ask ourselves, not only are you going to do your best to evaluate the system in which we are, I hope that you evaluate yourself in this section. Because I'm going to point to a system, but I hope that we point to ourselves. Because how can we ask somebody to be what we're not? 
This is one of my favorite things as now I, I, I had to do a lot of applications at the job. And, and, and I started realizing that I, I, like, I like reading resumes now. You know, I like reading resumes because it be, it, it's funny to me, to me. That you read all the qualifications. You read what you needed in order to get the job. Submitted your application knowing you didn't meet the qualifications. And then respond with a follow-up email to see if you in the interview process. No, the beginning was to say you needed this to be that. We grow up, I, I'm, I'm not going to speak on our younger generation, but I, I just, I'm going to say this. You ever heard fake it till you make it? We growing up with that new generation. They just be getting jobs like, I'll find out. <laughs> we'll make it. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> please don't. And some of us be, how do I say this nicely for the sake of time? Some of us be finagling our resumes. Finagling, that, that's a good choice of words. Like you knew you quit. <laughs> and you know that job doesn't belong on your resume. You just be blotting out history. Extending your dates on one job. Take it out of two years on this job. Some of us know what our degree was. We didn't necessarily graduate, but we attended. <laughs> they won't find out. That's what I feel like happens in the system. We got a lot of people who are faking it till they make it. We got a lot of people who are running who are not ethically and morally qualified. We got a lot of people who just want the power and position. And I'm not saying everyone. Remember, I repeat, this is not about everyone. But we do have people when power becomes a thing to clamor and want. Power is something that people desire for, so they will fake it until they get it. And right here, God is going to tell you, if you don't meet these qualifications, you don't get the job. And if you don't do these things, the punishment for you is worse than the person you just gave it to. So watch what he says, but also watch the results when we get to the end. Watch the qualification. He first starts out with something simple. And you can read it with me together. Verse 19, you shall not distort, watch these words, let's start at the bottom of 18 really quick, and they shall judge the people according with righteous judgment. Now let's read the rest. So we'll start with righteous. Then it says you shall not distort justice, you shall not be partial, you shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Justice is only and only justice you shall pursue. So let's start with the beginning, a righteous judge, but let's define righteous. A righteous is not just what is right. A righteous is defined as what God declares is right. So therefore, a judge, if you're asking him to be an agent and a representation of God, then they should be able to do what? Know what is right. So therefore, if they know what is right, they have to know what is God. And if they don't know what is God, then they don't know what is right. Again, I'm not asking you to vote for every Christian who says they're a Christian. I am asking you to watch their character or watch what you think they have so that you would at least know if they're even resembling the righteousness of God. Because the righteousness of God matters when you're making right and wrong decisions. Parents, can I give you, let's just stop for a second and pivot. How many of us as parents are making sure that we, just, we declare and live out the righteousness of God so when our kids come to us, we can declare not what we think and not what we've done and not what grandmama did, but what the righteousness of God has done. See, see, see it's just very similar because you reside as the judge of your own home. So since you are the judge, and you all know, parents, that we're the judge, you have to decide who's not sharing. You have to decide who didn't wash the dishes. You have to decide what kid is actually wrong, and you have to decide all of it. But if you're not living according to the righteousness of God, it's hard to declare what is right. It's hard to even know what to say because you be like, man, you deserve to get hit because you said that. And the last time I checked, well, Grandma said, if you get hit, hit back. But then I read the Bible, and it's like, wait a second. The Bible says, turn the other cheek. I can see a lot of parents are struggling with that statement. 
Now read your eyes. You're like, I don't know about that one, P. And then we start distorting scripture, right? We're like, well, Jesus did flip tables. At least let my son flip a table. <laughs> and if the table hits the other kid, amen. <laughs> I see what you did there. I read your eyes. The word righteous means, watch these words, not only what is right, not as what right in God's eyes, it means it is reliable. That means it comes out true every time. Oh, this is important. It can't shift with the times. This is important. Because as you could tell, judges are now judging based on what is what? Timely. That even Christians are shifting the righteous and reliability of God's word. That even now that because homosexuality is a hot topic, we're now shifting scripture. To make it fit because our political party says it has to fit in this category. When God is saying, no, the righteousness is still reliable from past time to this time. Stop making declarations on what you said you believed in. The problem with us is that politics makes you compromise. It is quite trendy to be on the right side of what they declare history. That you have to do what people say you have to do, and then you can make other judgments if you do the right trade-off. But the last time I checked, righteousness still lives on no matter what trade you make. Or maybe don't make a trade. It's the most polarizing system we live in, don't we? If you pick one side, you got to say a certain thing. If you pick another side, you got to say another thing. And if you pick one or the other side, no matter if it's right or wrong, you see it. We're just going to say whatever. I'm not going to get into it. No, it's not only a model code, but it's the correct judgment no matter how you feel. And this word's going to come back, the word correct. So how do you declare what's correct? It's right here. What is correct to you when you vote? Because I'm not just talking again about skin tone. I'm talking and I'm asking. Because the last time I checked, we had some incorrect judgments when we had history. We had people who said, you're not human. You barely have. Where did they find that in Scripture? Because last time I read my Bible, it says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that you were made in the image of God. So what judge read that one? Or did it fit the preference? Or did it make him feel better about himself? Or did he not want to offend his other friends that said that they aren't? Or maybe money started to drive the fact that slavery was okay. So we recently just heard on the news that civil war wasn't even about slavery in the first place. So what is correct? Because if it's all about money and slaves were free labor, say what you want, it all boils back down to a slave. People will fight over free. Can I say something to you real quick? My kid got called a monkey the other day. He got called a nigga. Kid came up to him and said, I really like Nigeria Rivers. Man, it's the first time I said flip a table, son. Flip his head on a table. Just bam, just flip it. I had, look, there was a divide in our house. <laughs> and you know what side I aired on, but Monica was like, boy, let this thing go. Let him ring. <laughs> I called the dad. I was hot. Randomly, by God's grace, I had the dad's number because they played baseball together. Isn't that funny? <laughs> Say, hey, just letting you know, <laughs> I know you're going to choose to believe whatever side of history you want to believe. And I respect you because it's your son. However, I'm not sure you know what your son said to my son today. And I respect you and I want you to know I still love you and I forgive you. However, I'll also let you know I'm hot. He says, I don't think my son knows the definition of the word. Oh, hear me out. <laughs> I got to get back to my topic. He talked to his son. 
And I'm not trying to be rude here. His son admitted that he said it, thank God. And he told his son what that word meant historically. And his son apologized to my son on the front of the bus. That's ironic. Then I wondered, what happens if we actually educated our kids on history and stop giving heroic accounters of what Black History Month is? Like, and I don't know whose side it needs to come from. But I know that if everybody goes to school, stop telling the same five stories in sci Fair Independent School District. We know Martin Luther King is real. You've proved that. Never told him what happened afterwards, but we proved that. But did you tell them that they were raped, called monkeys, blackface? Did you tell them that they were tied to poles and whipped till they were unrecognizable? Because and the only reason I'm saying this, because everybody's like, well, don't do it because we don't want to create hate. No. It creates what? Recognition so you don't repeat your mistakes. Therefore, my son doesn't get called a monkey and a nigga as he walks throughout the school. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the correct has always been correct, but if you don't want to talk about what correct is, and you want to think we could just blaze over it and paint heroic stories, then we're going to repeat history. And that goes not only for the kids that we're all thinking about, but it also goes for our children too. So I'm telling you, if the school ain't going to do it, you better. People wonder why our church is going to do black history well. It's because we recognize that black history is not being taught no more. That was about being correct. Then it says a couple things that happen when you're correct. You preserve peace and prosperity. Not only do you protect peace, but then I started to wonder when I started to read all the definitions of what happens. And again, in your notes, it will kind of give you what happens. Zechariah 7-9, Zechariah 8-16 talks about peace and satisfactory justice that will produce a prosperity life uh, full of peace and lack of problems in your country, in your towns. And then Malachi chapter 3, verse 18. And we'll talk about all these different things at the end. Because I want to get to the point where it says, what is righteous? And the word not only means that it is correct, not only reliable, not only true, not only biblical. It means that the person that you're voting for, the person that's in the office, or just yourself, means that if you are living a righteous judge, you are also the one who serves God in obedience. Let me see your character. Because the character of God will bring heavenly patterns to earth. That's what it says, that a righteous judge has a heavenly pattern. Because what was their job in the beginning? I told you what was their role. It was to be agents of God's justice. So if a person acts in God, guess what they produce? Heavenly patterns on earth. So then you look at our country today and you say, where is it? And I'm like, exactly where it's supposed to be. Because we have more politics, which is fine. The church, that means the church ain't doing their job. Because now we have to live in the reality. And I know this might sound pessimistic. We got to live in the reality of what politics are today. And we got to start living the reality of what the church should be and can be in the midst of the political world. That means people within the church are have to do their righteous jobs because sometimes we can't necessarily, not all people, depend on the political people to do the righteous job. And because they polarize us, that means you got to pick one side or the other, therefore letting go of some of your standards while you pick. Now, I know that was a lot. And that was just on the word righteous. But watch what he says. You not distort justice. You know what distort means? Twist. You can't twist justice. You can't make it say what you want it to say. Man, isn't that what's happening now? Like, you may not feel me. Maybe I'm the only one that has teenage kids in certain school districts. Like, that is what is happening. We are twisting words. Until somebody forces you to say what happened. Or you get called out, or you get caught on video. Then you can't escort what you did. 
now you're out here looking to plumb fool. You're like, oh, I didn't know that was out there. You can't distort a video, but you could definitely distort words, and that's exactly what he told the judges not to do. He says, do not twist justice. Do not twist what is fair. Do not make it fit your preferences, your personalities. Do not make it fit your skin tone. Do not make it fit. It is all about what I declare is right. You can't twist it from there. That is so hard in this world. I'm sympathetic to everybody who runs for office. Because you got, how do you maintain righteousness when righteousness ain't popular? But in order to win, you got to be popular. So when you do a popular vote, they out here trying to get the popular vote. And I, 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 if, that's why I ain't running. <laughs> I'm going to let other people do that. Then it says this, not only can you not twist it, don't mislead people. Because the word justice means on what is right. Or what is fair? Then it says this. Pursue that and only that. You know why it says the word pursue? You can look at verse 20. It says, only justice you shall pursue. And I was like, why did he say you shall pursue it? You know what pursue, pursue means? To follow. That means he knew when he wrote the text how hard it would be for people to keep the straight and narrow. So he says, hey, I know it's going to be hard as the world changes and everything changes around you. Your job is to pursue it. That means anxiously go after it. And if you cannot go after it, he's also telling you that truth will try to evade you. Your job is to pursue truth no matter how much it seems like it's getting out of the way. That's why I somehow struggle with people who have the same office for a certain amount of time and ain't nothing changed. Like, your stances hasn't changed. Like, you haven't even read nothing new. Look, man. <laughs> I don't know how to say this. If you're struggling with some recognition things, it might not be time for you to tell somebody else when to bomb somebody else. I'm just saying. I'm not talking about age because I love everybody. I'm talking about the ability to stand on your tooth and pursue the truth no matter how long it takes you and how much effort. Right, we, you can't be lazy in, in, in judgment at the same time. It's like when they keep handing out plea deals to our fellow brothers and sisters. It's like when you start handing 300 cases over to the public defender. And the public defender just walks in and is like, look, man, I ain't even read your file. And he, well, sir, don't you want to read my file so you can give me the, a good judge? Like, don't you want to make sure that I get, nah, look, man, look. You got two choices. Die or take probation and admit you guilty. But I didn't do it. Ah, I don't matter. Just take it. Now we have so many people walking around can't get jobs because you overload a public defender. Because nobody wants the job. Now, I ain't going to say it, but I'm going to say it. That also comes to us making sure our kids can get law degrees so that we can defend the people we complaining about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, pursuit of justice means that the person pursuing it might be tired. It might mean that he had to put in, she might have to put in extra hours because the pursuit is hard. Because when somebody doesn't mind not doing it, that means you're the only one doing it. If there wasn't a pursuit, that means that people wouldn't be fighting over what is true, by the way. You live in a world where they can declare truth as they see it. This is this new world where you can say this, my favorite phrase of all millennials. This is my truth. <laughs> I'm living in my truth. I'm not being facetious, even though it came across. Let me stop. It did come across that way. I apologize. Your truth has to align with God's truth. That's all I'm trying to say. So let me, without being facetious, let me say it the right way. Yours that doesn't align with God's shouldn't be yours. Simple math. But what we'll do is we'll excuse our emotions because we're living in something that we created. 
So if you can be relative to truth, then, oh, man, the pursuit is going to be hard. Because that means your truth can shift with wind. And that means your truth is based on your emotions. People have used that to do some crazy things. The club is my truth right now. He is my truth right now. All right, let him be your truth. And let's see your truth shift when he starts doing what he's supposed to do. You knew you picked him in some wrong truth. Watch what it says now. It says you shouldn't be partial. Man, this is such a key verse when it comes to black history. Partial means a recognition of a face. Hear that out. So when a judge would sit on the seat, he would say what? You got to act like you don't even recognize the face. How big were the towns again? They weren't big. So what he's saying is any judge has to act like he doesn't even recognize the face of the person coming to him. Because if he does act like it, and if he acts like that's his neighbor who he doesn't want something to happen to, then he's going to judge with partiality. So then you ask the question, how did we get into this necessity for Black History Month? It's because people were judging based on the recognition of a face. And when they saw a black face they didn't necessarily like, that's what they did. I'm partial to my white brother. Why do we have juries? And so hopefully people will be able to vote but you have multiple people that vote, hopefully with a lot of different biases, you try to get to one answer because we knew that they would upload the juries full of people that had a similar what? Partial bias. So now the vote don't matter. The judge don't matter because the jury going to do what's good for their friend that's sitting right there as a defense. Well, don't tell me partiality don't play its part. But that also goes to us, though. Because we can reverse the same thing, and nobody wants to talk about this. Because you can reverse your partiality, too. Yeah, I knew it was going to get eerily quiet when I said that. Because you can have your own partial ways because of what you've experienced and what somebody's face has done to you. So what you'll do is you'll start to have your own partial bias, and we'll start to say things that are assumptions that we don't even like about us. Well, so you know them. You know how they get down. The Bible says, you know what the Bible actually says even in church? Do you want to go to 1 Corinthians talking about the people that were being partial to the rich folk? And that rich folk would walk in town and they got extra seats at communion? Meanwhile, the broke people was in the hallway taking theirs last and leftovers? So not only are we talking about the church, we're talking about the political system, and we're talking about judges, and we're talking about you personally. You can't have a partial recognition of a face. It's hard when you got hurt. Some of us got hurt by a system that we don't want to enter into no more because we started putting our belief that everybody in the system was either going to be partial or not partial. It's funny. We walk in innocent, don't we? Oh, everybody loves me. You get slapped five times. You're like, everybody hates me. Now you got to figure out where's the middle. Yes, everybody has their partiality, but your job is to live righteously, so you can't have the same benefit. You know how hard it is not to have the same benefit of other people and trust God for the results? That's so hard. Like, coming to living where it ain't easy if you're not similar. Because you have to let go of your partiality, and we got to let go of ours. If you want a multi-ethnic church, it doesn't just start with them accepting us. It's the reverse as well. Do we love people the same way when they walk through these doors? Because some of us know how it feels to walk in a door and you be the only one. Then everybody be like this. (laughs) Me and Monica found this secret spot in the woodlands one time. It was crazy. And everybody's like, well, hello. (laughs) We knew what it felt like. But can I be blunt? I also know what it felt like when I decided to date my wife. And I got stares from both sides. Nah, it didn't feel good there neither. For black people to judge me for dating a Latina, 
Latino, ju- Latino to judge her for dating a black. And for us not to be judged because we didn't bother anybody else on the other side. <laughs> that I didn't love my own kind because I didn't date a black woman. When it just could be the fact that I, I love the person that God allowed me to have. Yeah. See, nobody... So we don't like the other side of this coin, do we? Everybody's like, move on with your sermon. (laughs) I'm going to speed through this next one. But it says one thing. Don't take a bribe. Just to summarize. Whew. But it feels like the whole system is built on money. Doesn't it? Like, rich people get to tell and talk to people who also are running for stuff that also donate to your campaign. And then they like, well, look, man, look. If I get in trouble, just remember who I am. Here's a Millie. (laughs) Don't, like, don't take a bribe. What he's saying is that the moment you take a bribe, you will no longer be able to see justice no more. Sheesh. Like, you Like, you can't even see it. It says it blinds your eyes. If I were to give you so many texts, I challenge you to read your notes for the sake of time. I want to, you got Exodus chapter 18, verse 21. Micah, verses 7, 3. You got Isaiah 5, 23. And the reason why I give you all those verses so you can see them is that they started taking them. That's That's why you don't want somebody who loves money running for office. Because sooner or later, money going to run them. Man, I'm sorry. It said it perverts justice. You know what the word pervert justice means? Twisted. That a, a person who takes bribes is sooner or later going to twist justice because they took it. I, I don't trust you if money rules you. I also don't trust you if power rules you. I want to see public servants going back to that definition of servants, where they serve the communities in which they are voted to protect without being told what that community needs because of money. Man, I'm going to get this part because I got to finish with this part. And watch what it says in verse 20. Justice and only justice is what you get. You shall pursue it. I already talked about it. That you may live. But watch what it says. And possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. He's saying that you may. Now, this is where the theological outline of a sermon becomes most beautiful you've ever seen. Why? Because watch them possess the land. Start taking bribes, start messing up judgments, and you realize that even though they had the promised land, guess what they didn't get to do? Live in it. Like, if you were to read the Bible, you would realize, now this is where some scripture is going to have to be heard and understood. You would realize in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 23, he is now prophesying against what they had become in the promised land. So he's saying, hey, God gave you the land, just do justice. And then guess what they do? They pervert justice. And then God's like, yo, I'm going to take you into captivity if you don't start to live according to what I told you to live and judge according to how I told you to judge. I told you how to rule. You're going to deny it? Well, here you go. It's crazy that you can read a a verse in Deuteronomy and it comes true in Isaiah. That God had warned them before. He set up the system so it wouldn't. But when you leave God, you're going to leave justice. When you leave God, you're going to leave righteousness. So, of course, what happens to your land if even your leaders don't follow God? The land you want got taken. The land I gave you. Now, pay attention. You took your own privileges away. You didn't even have to fight for what I gave you. And I gave it to you. Even though, now here's the beauty, even though I already knew you was going to jack it up, God's a good God. He be giving the stuff knowing you're going to mess up what he gave you.
Then he tries to send you messengers that would tell you, please fix it. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm going to take it. I gave it to you. Guess what it means? If I can give it, I can take it. Say, man, fix it. Then we go all the way to Malachi, to Zechariah, Micah. Everybody loves reading Micah 6, 6 through 8. It's their favorite verse when it talks about justice. But Micah came after Isaiah. So guess what happened? Even after they went into captivity, they came right back and was like, well, look, man, bribe ain't so bad after all. Hey, who cares about the poor? Do you know that they were still showing partiality all the way into the New Testament? I guess what I'm trying to say, you're like, Pierre, you're painting the most ugly picture. I'm painting a real picture. But it also paints this realistic picture of the ending. If every person, no offense, in their humanity will struggle with justice, which is true, then why do we keep putting our hope in man? This is the biggest kicker, is that many of us are disappointed in a system run by a man or woman who is not necessarily living according to God. So your best hope, last hope, only hope, is God. Like, stop putting hope and God-like expectations in the people who have from historically proven that they won't be able to withhold a godly standard forever. I'm not saying a couple of them won't. I'm not saying a majority of them won't. What I am saying is at the end of the day, it's all God. At the end of what you put your hope in. So when you go look for a job and you're expecting them not to be partial, stop asking people to not be people. And start asking God to be God. Like, that makes you change the way you walk into an interview. Because you realize, if this job is for me, no matter what partiality this interviewer got, this job is for me. So I'm going to be me, natural, in all of my beauty. I'm going to wear the style of hair that I want to wear. I'm not going to change. I might code switch a couple words. <laughs> you can't start off an interview with, all right, man. You can't start it off like that. <laughs> you see what I'm saying is? You can't start it off like that either. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He like, no, I don't. I don't uh. <laughs> By the way, on your resume, it says you didn't. Ah, you read the resume? <laughs> that joke come full circle. What I am saying is this. We can stop and start. Stop. Keep voting. Do what, what we've been gifted to do. Appoint yourself your own judges. But then you are expected to live according to the righteousness of God. And then you hold people to the same standard that are in offices. But while they might fail you, God hasn't. So all the bureaucracy in which they exist in, God doesn't. So since that is the case, vote but put hope in God. Vote but keep your hope and the only one who exists above all systems. He's the only one that has you in these seats today. But I'll tell you this. If you don't choose to live according to the righteousness of God and help your brothers and sisters that are less fortunate, I don't know, less advantage, less this, less that, then what are we really doing? You're complaining about something you don't even want to fix yourself. So it's a twofold problem. And one you have control over. You know what I love? My wife came to me the other day. She, she likes to boost me a couple times, and she told me this. So I forgot what happened. We was on vacation, and we were wringing out the clothes before we tried to pack them. We went, to, went swimming before we got sick. And she was like, baby, could you wring this out a little bit tighter so it can get a little bit drier? I was like. Well, yes, I can. <laughs> it just so happened I was in my swimwear. So I hit him with a couple of those.
But as I started to wring it out, the liquid that was in it came out of it. Because when something's wet, it's only wet with what it was wet with. You can't wring out something that's not there. So it's our job to make sure that you vote for the person who has the water of God inside of them. Because when they start to get wrung out, they're only going to pour out justice. But if you know somebody has been stained, tainted, perverted, distorted, then when it gets to wringing out, stop complaining about the fact that there's Kool-Aid when there's supposed to be water. Let and keep and know at the end of the day, God is still in control. Let us pray. We are excited that you have joined us and I pray this message touched your life. We pray that you enjoyed it. We pray that it impacted your heart and we hope that you would subscribe and continue to grow with all the messages that are here to find a sermon outline. So we're glad you enjoyed it. Look forward to you coming back so we grow together. Thank you for blessing us and for blessing your life by allowing us to serve you.